think it's, it's a true honor for me to be chosen for this award um, this year. It has been a terrific three years uh, as faculty so far at Fred Hutch, and uh, I'm trying to keep up the momentum. I'm trying to you know, really present the, the two key technologies and the um, two products that we developed over the past year for clinicians to apply immunotherapy and apply T-cell therapy, make it easier for them to really plug it into established protocols. And um, in general, both products I'm presenting are um, really a combination of synthetic materials and immunotherapy. So it's immunobioengineering, that's the field I'm working in. And the first um, technology is, and some of you might have heard me present, so I'll update you on this as well, uh, including the most recent data, but it's a tool for surgeons, specifically for surgeons to apply uh, adoptive immune T cell therapy. Uh, for instance, for a brain tumor where it's, um, you know, 90% of patients relapse from, uh, you know, residual disease, which is here two centimeter from the resection margin, uh, but also in uh, irresectable tumors such as here ovarian cancer or a you know, metastatic disease that cannot be completely resected. Um, you might have heard of uh, adoptive T-cell therapy, CAR T-cell therapy. It's now a huge field um, to use your own T-cells to do this job and find residual tumor cells. And now it's uh, essentially a CAR T-cell race with more than um, 12 companies competing for the same pool of patients, which is mostly uh, patients with uh, hematological malignancies. So liquid tumors, uh, CD19, CARs, so they get like 90% complete response rates, uh, um, actually cures in these uh, patients. The problem is that once you treat solid tumor, and this is a cross-section of the pancreatic cancer patient um, that was provided to me by Venu Pilarisetti, who's a pancreatic surgeon here. And so we stained this section as now a solid tumor uh, with uh, tumor markers here, mesothelin in red, EPCAM, which is a kind of stem cell marker in blue. And here in green, you see the uh, pancytokeratin staining. So that's where the adenocarcinoma is when you section it. And you see that it's very heterogeneous. So if you want to target and really cure this pancreatic cancer with a single product and a single uh, you know, chimeric antigen receptor, the problem is that you can easily eradicate, let's say, the red cells, but then you know the ones Let's say this tumor here, they neither have red nor blue, so they will ultimately relapse and the patient will die from this disease. So compared to liquid tumors where you can easily achieve complete cures using adoptive T-cell therapy, the problem with solid malignancies is that they're very heterogeneous all over the place. And um, uh, it's really you know, Im impossible to completely eradicate disease with a single product. You might say, well, so just make more T cells. Um, you know, why not make CAR T cells against? Um, why not make CAR T cells against? Um, you know, against mesothelin, against EPCAM, against multiple targets. Mix them together, infuse them into the patient. And the problem is, as you can see here, each of those products have to be custom made for every patient. Uh, the estimate is that it's going to be around five hundred thousand dollars per patient per product. So if you now imagine that if a diagnosed pancreatic cancer patient wants to be treated with three products, so that's already $1.5 million per patient. And if you think about 1.5 million newly diagnosed cancer patients in the United States, so that's like $750 billion healthcare costs a year just to treat every diagnosed patient with adoptive T-cell therapy. You see it's an extremely complicated process to manufacture these cells for every patient. And um, so that's pretty much the problem that we have right now, that we get really nice uh, response rates in hematological malignancies. In solid tumors, we have uh, tumor heterogeneity. So we wanted to solve this problem with um, a biomaterial. And we first wanted to uh, exemplify the problem. What is the problem in a mouse tumor model? And that's the tumor model here, uh, pancreatic cancer. It's an um, orthotopic tumor model. We inject pancreatic cancer cells um, that are derived from a spontaneously uh, developing pancreatic tumor mouse model into the head of the pancreas. 
you see here when you do histology, so here we actually get these nice ducts that are similar to human disease. Here on the right is then the healthy pancreas. And that's what, what, what you get when you now phenotype these tumors, similar to the situation in patients. You can take out these tumors and every single tumor cell, this is a flow cytometry and every, every line is a single cell. And our tumor antigen that we wanted to monitor is uh, Ray1. And you see that, you know, there's no, it's a, it's a heterogeneity. Some tumor cells express really high levels of this tumor antigen. Others express low or no tumor antigen. So we kind of model the, the human disease with this, uh, with this, uh, with this mouse model. And um, you can easily generate chimeric antigen receptors that can you know, kill these tumor cells in vitro in a Petri dish. That's not a problem. So the chimeric antigen receptor that we uh, are using was generated uh, by Charles Sentman. And they can actually recognize this Ray1 tumor antigen. And you can generate T cells. They kill. So it's not a problem to kill these tumor cells in the Petri dish. But when you now inject them into those mice, so these are mice with established pancreatic cancer. And the tumor is bioluminescent, so we can image you know, the progress and the, uh, you know, the therapeutic response. And when we infuse these T cells that are either now control T cells or tumor-specific chimeric antigen receptor T cells, you see you know, they do kind of, you know, that's where they're supposed to go here. That's the tumor. We're imaging the T cells here. You see some of those T cells make it to the tumor. Um, most of them get trapped here in the lung, in the spleen. Uh, the ones that make it to the tumor don't persist very, very long. And that's the result of a lot of suppressor cells that are present at the tumor site. As a result, then, you know, you get a little bit of tumor shrinkage, but essentially you, you don't get a complete cure rate. And that's kind of the status quo of CAR T cell therapy at the moment. You know, at UPenn, antimesothelin chimeric antigen receptor. That's kind of the clinical response rates that they, they get. They get like you know, a couple of months longer survival, um, but definitely not any, any uh, long-term benefits. You can now take out the tumors, and what you see is pretty much nothing. There's almost no difference between the, t the tumors that have been treated with T cells versus the tumors that are untreated. You see a little bit greener here, so which means that some of the T cells actually, you know, eradicated uh, the antigen positive uh, tumor cells. And, uh, but essentially all the tumors that are relapsing still have the antigen on the surface. So the T cells are not really proliferating, in the, proliferating the T cells are not persisting. And so now we said, let's, let's start with a biomaterial, let's start with an implant. And we asked the question, if we deliver anti-tumor T cells with a biomaterial implant, and the biomaterial implant is porous. It can be loaded with anti-tumor T cells. And inside of these uh, implants are little particles. And they're loaded with um, essentially all the growth factors that these T cells need for a full-fledged activation. So we really provide them with the best, everything they could possibly ask for from these little stimulatory particles. And so the question we ask is, if we deliver now pancreatic cancer-specific T cells using this biomaterial, can we eradicate disease? I mean, is it just a matter of having more T cells at the tumor, and um, then they would do a better job and eventually eradicate disease? Now, um, so that's the implant. Here's our pancreatic cancer. We're loading them with anti-cancer CAR reprogrammed T cells. We're implanting it, so it's all a mouse model, obviously. And then the idea is that they're proliferating and they're getting into the tumor and hopefully they're eradicating. So the, the implant, and we've described this before, is doing its job. So it's really making T cells feel good, make them proliferate. Um, here's a bioluminescent T cell imaging. On the right is bimaterial delivered. On the left is just injected T cells. You see that those T cells are here at the pancreas, as you would expect, and you get around 160-fold better persistence and expansion. So 160-fold higher T cell biomass here on day eight at the pancreatic tumor site. So that's a lot of really more T cells. Um, so the question is, are they doing their job, and is it enough to eradicate disease? 
And you see, so they're doing their job, the, the, the tumor is shrinking way more than if you don't deliver them with a the bimaterial. Uh, the problem is that all the mice are relapsing. You see that we can extend the survival, we can double the survival, but all the mice are essentially uh, dying. And when you look at the tumor, they're doing their job. You see everything is green, which means that the T cells did their job and they successfully wiped out all the antigen specific T cells. So even if you gave more and more and more and more T cells, wouldn't make much of a difference because the tumors that are relapsing are the ones that don't even express the targeted antigen. So, so far, so what we know is if we deliver T cells with a bimaterial, it can amplify expansion, persistence, several lock, and it can also then, you know, eradicate, uh, uh, you know, uh, reduce the tumor burden. But, you know, ultimately what we want is really get rid of all the tumor cells. And so the idea was now that we are loading these particles, not just with growth factors that benefit the T cells, but we also load them with very strong, um, potentially toxic, um, danger signals. So adjuvants, vaccine adjuvants, that are, we are giving at a concentration locally at the tumor side that would be impossible to give intravenously because it would just create systemic autoimmunity. And the idea then, the T cells are coming out, they're doing their job, they're eradicating the uh, antigen positive tumor cells, but then these tumor cells that are, don't express the antigen, we would then eradicate them with the host immune system that we are activating with this uh, vaccine adjuvant. So essentially, one wave of anti-tumor T cell attack is the CAR T cells with the scaffold, and then the second wave is from your own body. Importantly, the second wave, so your own immune system, this immune response is targeted against multiple epitopes. So it's really like a, like a real vaccine. So there's no way that a tumor could potentially escape because we are lysing, we are destroying tumor cells. That's so like a whole cell cancer vaccine. And um, we chose a sting agonist. I don't know if you can see that here. It's a sting agonist that is currently in clinical trial. It's toxic if you give it intravenously at high doses, but we loaded these particles with this sting agonist, and we wanted to know if, first of all, when we load, uh, put the sting agonist on top of the tumor with this implant, if this has any therapeutic response. You see, it does a little bit, so just by itself, the sting agonist uh, certainly reduces the tumor burden, but when you now co-deliver the anti-tumor T cells with the sting agonist, you get a synergistic anti-tumor response and you actually get here some tumor clearance in some of the mice and we're still following this up long-term in 20 mice right now. Um, importantly, so we get the synergy but we wanted to know what's going on at the host. Is it really that we are activating the host T cells with this scaffold, with the sting agonist? And so we used um, an NFAT luciferase Reporter mouse. So this mouse creates, generates light only if you activate this mouse's uh, immune cells, T cells. And we then repeated the experiments and we put the implant into those mice. And you see, obviously, without any implant, you see no signal. If you implant the vaccine scaffold, you see a bioluminescent signal. So you get some, some uh, host T cell activation. With the T cell scaffold, you get more signal, but then if you combine, so you're actually delivering T cells in a vaccine scaffold, you get a synergistic um, host uh, immune response. You can quantify that it's around tenfold higher. So you can actually then activate uh, your host immune system against pancreatic cancer using this uh, scaffold. And we wanted to know, I mean, we don't know what this is. We don't know what this is against. We don't know what these T cells react against. Um, so we wanted to exemplify it with a single antigen that is well, well characterized. It's a viral antigen. Uh, it's a LCMV, a viral peptide, GP33. Uh, there's a lot of reagents out there. And we could lentivirally uh, transduce and engineer pancreatic tumor cells that express this antigen. So now we have one single antigen and we just wanted to know if we now have one single antigen that we can track 
can we repeat these experiments and confirm that we, with a scaffold, we can actually get much higher um, host demon responses. So we transplanted these mice, uh, these tumors, then into uh, CD45.1 mice. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but CD45.1 is a congenic marker, so you can actually track um, the lymphocytes that come from this host. The reason why it's important is because we are obviously doing adoptive T-cell therapy, so we have to differentiate between T-cells that we're transferring versus T-cells that are in the host, and so we had to use the CD45.1 recipient mice and then treat them with CD45.2 donor mice. So we can then, with flow cytometry, say, you know, these are really the host T-cells and not the T-cells we infused with our scaffold or implanted with the scaffold, and then we can really only gate on the CD45.1 and then ask the question, do we get higher tetramer stain? And again, so we can confirm with the tetramer staining that we can get uh, here a uh, synergistic effect, higher TP33 tetramer staining, so there are way more um, antigen-specific T cells in the host if we co-deliver the T cells, the CAR T cells with the vaccine scaffold. And you can in the peripheral blood, you can count the number of the cells. It's around tenfold, similar to what we've seen. So in summary, so what, what, I've, what I showed you is that um, we can use, and what we developed is we can really use uh, porous polymer implants to deliver CAR T cells. We get 160-fold higher expansion persistence of these T cells at the tumor site. So that's that by itself is pretty pretty cool when you think about it, 160 times more T cells. That certainly helps. Um, but what is really important is that we can also co-deliver a strong vaccine adjuvant, a strong danger signal, which will then turn the cancer into an in situ cancer vaccine, which means that your own your host, your own immune system gets activated against the tumor. And we can then by this achieve synergy. Importantly, I just want to point it out, this is without any toxicity in terms of systemic autoimmune disease. So this is not the CTLA-4 checkpoint blockade uh, systemic autoimmunity uh, side effects that you would expect. This is local and it's slow and sustained release. So that's the first part. That's the first technology. It's an, it's an implant. Second technology is, um, I guess I brought it here. I was going to shoot a photo, but it's a, it's, um, it's a polymer. It's a nanoparticle. And it's off the shelf. So as you can see, it is, um, can be lyophilized. It can be bottled up, can be shipped, can be uh, made large scale. And the question or the main problem that we're addressing is that currently, even if you use the implant that I just described, the problem is that if you get diagnosed with cancer and you want to undergo CAR T cell therapy, that you're the patient, you still have to undergo leukapheresis, somebody has to manufacture your T cells, grow them, large batches, billions of them, reinfuse them back. This all has to be done in a sterile cell manufacturing facility. Like I said, a lot of technical expertise required, and it's about 500,000, so it's really patient-specific, so it cannot be applied to a large patient population. And we're not talking about these 1.5 million newly diagnosed cancer patients. What I had in mind is, why not, you know, if we really want to outcompete chemotherapy um, or antibody therapies or really off-the-shelf um, reagents, so that's how they're manufactured, they're made you know, by Amgen or Biogen or large batches. They're bottled up, they're lyophilized, and then they're given to you know, whoever needs them at the time of diagnosis. So in order to address this problem, we wanted to make CAR T cell therapy off the shelf. So we wanted to you know, create a product that essentially can be given, can be manufactured the same way as chemotherapy. So we uh, developed the ART platform, so targeted rapid anti-tumor immunity. As you can see, the key player here in red is a nanoparticle. And here is the T cell. Here are the chimeric antigen receptors. And 
the nanoparticle is engineering, is programming CAR T cells. And it does so in situ, inside of your body. So not, no bleeding involved, no cell manufacturing involved. The system works that you get diagnosed with cancer and then you would be given off the shelf nanoparticle that nanoparticles that are loaded, and I'll show you in a second, with chimeric antigen receptor encoding transgenes. And then on the surface of the nanoparticle, you have a T cell targeting ligand. These nanoparticles then get infused into the bloodstream. They find circulating lymphocytes. They then get taken up through receptor mediated endocytosis, and they are integrated into the genome and they start expressing than these chimeric antigen receptors. So it's in situ T cell programming of CAR T cell, um, CAR T cells. Now that's kind of the journey you would expect. So if you're the nanoparticle, here's your lymphocyte. So the first thing is you go inside into the endosome. Here's the cytoplasm. So here are the microtubules. Here's the <laughs> nucleus coming towards you. And so you have to get into the nucleus. Here are your chromosomes. And so now in your chromosomes, you have to integrate your, your CAR transgene. So that's the job. And so as you can imagine, that's a fairly long, what's the likelihood, right? So that this will happen. Uh, so it's, it's kind of an engineering challenge to um, get this accomplished. And we've you know, really optimized the system now for the past three years. And we came up with this uh, nanoparticle um, that First of all, it's a targeting ligand, has um, anti-CD3 antibodies, um, and they are linked to polyglutamic acid, so that's kind of shielding the DNA which is inside very nicely. It's a negative charge, so if you inject this into patients, you wouldn't expect any toxicities because of charge issues and aggregation. Uh, the, the, the net charge is negative. And then inside, you see the plasmid DNA, and the plasma DNA is um, condensed with a polymer which is protecting the DNA from any degradation, but the polymer uh, pretty much falls apart within, uh, it has a half-life of four hours. So within four hours in water, the polymer falls apart. So what we're encoding is kind of what Juno is uh, delivering at the moment. It's just the mouse version. It's a 19 foreign dB zeta chimeric antigen receptor. So it targets mouse CD19, it can reprogram mouse T cells to recognize CD19 leukemia and B cells. And importantly, we are co-delivering this construct with a transposase, a hyperactive transposase, which then you know, mediates, it cuts out this fraction here and then pastes it into the genome. So it, the goal is not just to reprogram T cells for a little bit, but really turn them into serial killers. So we really want to make sure that the chimeric antigen receptor transgene is integrated into the chromosome so every time the T cell proliferates, it takes this transgene with it. Um, just keep in mind, so we are co-expressing this chimeric antigen receptor with a chief P. luciferase reporter that will become important for the next couple of slides um, so we can actually track where we are programming those T cells. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge Michel, so he was my mentor over the past three years um, in terms of uh, providing me with reagents. He was my uh, graduate student, my PhD supervisor, and he provided me with uh, the chimeric antigen receptor gene encoding this um, mouse CD19, uh, 19.4 BBC in a car. But he also provided me with an, another very um, useful reagent, which is a leukemia cell line, a mouse leukemia cell line, so we can actually try it therapeutically. So it's a, a mouse leukemia cell line that is modeling acute lymphoblastic leukemia in mice. That's what it looks like. You inject it, and then pretty much after 12 days, 13, 14 days, the mice die from disseminated disease in the bone marrow and in the lymph nodes. Um, so the way we treat these mice with nanoparticles, so again, we start off with a lyophilized product. It's, uh, all I'm doing is really adding distilled water, the vorticling a little bit, and then it's ready to inject into mice. And we injected mice first with this leukemia cell line, 
we waited one week and then we treated them Monday through Friday, so five doses of these nanoparticles. Um, each dose is a 100 microgram of DNA, so it's quite a lot of DNA per mouse. So total, every mouse gets half a milligram of DNA. Um, so five doses, and then every three days, we imaged the bioluminescence of our reporter. So we wanted to know where, where do we reprogram, and do we reprogram at all? Uh, where do we reprogram our CAR T cells in situ? Again, so how the way we're infusing these nanoparticles is not that you know, I'm sticking a needle into the tail vein and shooting it in, but it's a slow infusion um, using a microfluidic syringe pump. So we wanted to mimic, in a way, kind of an antibody infusion or maybe bite antibodies. So over half an hour, 15 minutes, really slow infusion. We wanted to give the nanoparticles some time to really find the T cells, reprogram them, and not just shoot them in. Uh, so that's why we're using these uh, syringe pumps. And so what you see here on the left are untreated mice, on the right are nanoparticle injected mice. So again, so the nanoparticle express uh, and code the 194 BBC at a car and luciferase. So we're not looking at tumor here. The mice have tumors, but they don't express luciferase. But we're looking at the signal that comes from nanoparticle reprogrammed T cells. And the first thing we notice is, um, so we're injecting one, two, three, four, five doses every day, Monday through Friday. So we image on Monday, and then on Wednesday, what you see that we get some signal in the spleen, and that's pretty much um, in all of the mice that we treated that the first signal is in the spleen. But then, you know, we stop injecting uh, nanoparticles, but nonetheless, what you see is over time that these, these, these hot spots that we created, these T cells, just start expanding. And they start expanding from the spleen to the lymph node, from the lymph node to the bone marrow, and pretty much they go to the disease sites where the you know, leukemia is. Um, they reach a climax like around two weeks and then uh, day 30, they start contracting and uh, we still have to do the phenotype. I assume they're member phenotype, but um, so in a way, it's not that they're just taking off like, like a leukemia and they you know, expand indefinitely, but they're proliferating and they are then contracting and they apparently go to sites of um, where the disease is. So, so far, we treat 10 mice, and it's still early um, because, you know, yesterday was uh, just day 30. But so far, 9 out of 10 mice are still alive with the nanoparticle injections, and uh, the controlled mice died. So it's a fairly rapidly progressive uh, disease. Now, so what, what we're doing is we are not infusing those mice with billions of T cells. We're not, you know, bombarding them with tons of T cells, but... All we're doing is we're just creating a spark, right? Just like a match. And then you have a little hot spot in the spleen. Um, you just reprogram a couple of T cells. But these T cells express a chimeric antigen receptor that is engineered, provides them with a lot of co-stimulation. There are a lot of B cells around, a lot of leukemia cells around. Once they're reprogrammed, they recognize these B cells and leukemia cells, and they self-amplify. So that's kind of the... Okay, so I think that's where we are um, at the moment. This is uh, conventional adapt uh, CAR T cell therapy, like Juno and Novartis. Uh, there's definitely we still have some some uh, a long way to go, um, but we're improving it. And we're, our goal is to really have it with a single injection. We're trying to increase efficiency using these guys here. You might know them, the dynein motor proteins. And we identified a peptide in the lab that can be covalently coupled to our nanoparticles. And then the plan is that we are abusing these microtubule, uh, these dynein motor proteins, to fast track our nanoparticle cargo into the nucleus, so our DNA, so that once we have the nanoparticle in the cytoplasm, with this peptide, we can then use these dynein proteins and they are shuttling the DNA into the nucleus. So we hope that with this second generation of uh, particles, so I haven't finished the illustration, but essentially it's the same particle, but it has here 
on those red, um, on the polymers, we have then uh, chemically linked uh, microtubule binding peptides, which will then um, label these <coughs> nanoparticles and make sure that they get shuttled into the nucleus like as a fast track. Um, and so that's our second generation that we're working on, and I hope that we can uh, achieve similar therapeutic responses with a single injection. That's our ultimate goal. So where, where do we see it? So that's our platform. This is a kind of overview over um, the conventional immunotherapy that is available. We're trying to establish ourselves between conventional adaptive T-cell therapy and antibodies, vaccines. Um, vaccines, you know, they're fairly slow as cancer vaccines. So prostate cancer vaccine, you know, have prime boost, 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 boost. Um, they're off the shelf. So that's good, but the problem is, I mean, what are we really activating here? I mean, what are we expanding? Think, think about dendrion. I mean, what are they expanding? They're, they're expanding low affinity, if at all, low affinity prostate tumor specific T cells because all tumor is self antigen. So physiologically, there are only some low affinity uh, T cells in your circulation, in your repertoire. And so conventional, um, conventional cancer vaccines are um, designed to, you know, expand these um, uh, really low affinity um, uh, TCR populations. Antibodies are fast, um, so they can be given right away. Um, they're off the shelf, so it's also good, but they're passive. So, you know, you're not actually educating the immune system, but you're just, you, know, you constantly have to infuse them if you want to have any therapeutic effect there. Um, they're rapidly cleared from the blood, so um, and so they cannot penetrate tumor very nicely. So they are too large to penetrate. They're not actively migrating into tumor. Adaptive T cell therapy is uh, definitely acts fast once you in inject it. It takes around three four weeks to manufacture this product, so you have to wait for that. Um, the problem is they are personalized, so they cannot be made, you know for a large patient population. Uh, the advantage is that they're um, really encoding engineered receptors, chimeric antigen receptors, that don't exist in your repertoire. I mean, these are receptors that are have like a thousand-fold higher affinity as your own immune cells. They express molecules that don't exist in your immune, immune system, like these chimeric antigen receptors that provide supra-physiological um, co-stimulation, and so we are taking, I think, the best features of conventional adaptive T-cell therapy and antibodies, and we're combining it as the art platform. It's off the shelf, it's fast, and we really reprogrammed your immune system with these supra-physiological receptors that don't exist. We're trying it out with, in prostate cancer right now. Um, it's a little more challenging because there's not a lot of uh, tumor antigen around. So once you reprogram a couple of T cells, for them it's harder to find some tumor antigen. Um, also, think about HIV. So it's not, we're probably going to publish the first paper, just leukemia, but that's just proof of concept. Um, we're trying to expand to infectious diseases. HIV, there's a lot of antigen, uh, chimeric antigen receptors have been described to target HIV, so we could, you can imagine that you can reprogram your immune system to recognize HIV uh, with you know, a single off-the-shelf drug, off-the-shelf reagent. Um, we're not limited to CAR T cells. Um, we tested in, in our lab also the high affinity T cell receptors, so you can reprogram your immune system using uh, nanoparticles encoding tumor or virus-specific T cell receptors. So the advantage being that now you can also target cytoplasmic antigen presented in MHC, so you're not limited to surface antigen. And so these are some, uh, I think you might know their faces by now, but they're HIV elite controllers. Uh, and I guess everybody would want their <coughs> high affinity T cell receptors that uh, recognize HIV. And they've been described, and uh, people have started using them for gene therapy. But what we, what we could do is really deliver them using nanoparticles so that you can, even in developing countries, 
uh, immunize or reprogram a large patient population with these elite controller um, T cell receptors. That's um, really uh, a lot of applications. We're trying to get into the hepatitis field, so chronic infections um, um, that we deliver hepatitis specific T cell receptors. So you might know this drug, uh, $1,000 a pill. Um, it's uh, already FDA approved for hepatitis. Um, but as you can see here, so that's just the healthcare spending last year um, for hepatitis only using this drug. And again, so with our car, with our um, nanoparticle gene therapy, we hope that we can do better and we can offer this at a more affordable price and actually we then reprogram your immune system. So it's, this is a small molecule drug, so um, we are using the immune system, we're reprogramming your immune system to recognize these diseases. With that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, people in my lab and our funding. <laughs>